Right. Just like that, we are live. I apologize for the delay, but I just heard in the chat that Eric Irway is just wrapping up his uh, keynote or conversation over there at uh, Meet Magento Romania. And so this hopefully is a, an interesting conversation to kind of follow that up with. We are having a little bit of technical difficulty. So unfortunately, Willem has not been able to connect. But we do have the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Benai Cop. Hopefully, all of y'all know who he is. Well, I don't think he needs introduction in the Magento space. But Benai, thanks for joining me this morning, this this evening for you. Um, I know this is an important conversation for a lot of folks in the Magento community. So I'm I'm glad you could join and and we could talk about it. Thanks for having me. Happy to be on your stream. I mean, I've watched it many times, but. Uh... Excited to be here. Well, this is going to be a fun one. Um, it's, cool. it's a little bit of a, a sad one, though. This is the last stream from this studio. This is the Seriously? final oh. final one. We've got a new one we're working on. Wow. It's not quite ready, but we have sold this house that this studio is in, and, and I've got about 30 days to finish the other house and move. So this will be the final one. We'll start breaking down this studio this weekend. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, awesome. looking forward to having the other one. I'm tired of picking paint colors. Like I've got, my desk is just full of paint samples, you know, and all sorts of fun stuff. I'm, I'm tired of all of that. And I'm, I'm glad to be back talking about e-commerce. So everyone who's watching, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. This is as always an interactive conversation and, and I'll be, I'm trying to keep up and addressing those comments and, and concerns as we go. And, and if Willem hacks happens to, you know, I can't unfortunately help him, but if he happens to figure out his technical issues, um, we'll we'll bring him in here to this conversation as well. Um, so, right. if you would, let's let's start with the basics. I mean, I, we we have a very technical audience, but let's define what a what is a fork. What are we talking about here when we talk about forking a software project? A uh, fork basically just a clone from a repository that then uh, develops in a slightly different direction than the original repository. <laughs> Simple. Simple enough. Basically, we're going to be, you know, creating a new project that is a, a, a derivative that will, will take a different path forward than, than the well, existing project, right? So the terms based on, I guess, I don't know if it already existed back in, in CSV or SVN days, but uh, the thing about forks is every time somebody creates a branch, in effect, it's nothing but a small fork, right? And then later often they can be merged back together again, or maybe parts of it can be merged back again. So many differences there. Um, yeah, technically every single, every time you hit the clone button in GitHub, a fork gets created. So after seeing, well, we already have around 9,000 forks of Magento currently just, just on GitHub, uh, I felt like, maybe fork isn't the right name and uh, we settled on distribution might be a better name because there aren't correct, you know, it's 
are sometimes difficult to put the right label onto things, which clearly describes it so everybody understands what it is, what is meant. So why do you think now is the right time to, to do this with Magento Open Source? Mm -hmm. Well, there are several reasons. Uh, personally, the main reason why now is because my feeling is um, we've been waiting for so long and with we, I don't just mean, you know, some nebulous mass, but myself plus and friends of mine that I, I happen to know all around the world and and we've been waiting for something to happen which hasn't happened. So it's it feels like it's time to take matters into our own hands and take care of things develop in a direction we we want them to develop. And um, another reason is I've been kind of seeing so many friends get more and more frustrated with kind of the direction Magento Adobe Commerce is heading into. It doesn't fit their requirements anymore. So they start shopping around and moving somewhere else. And that's totally okay. But I, I really have enjoyed all these years working with these people. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I want to stop that movement, right? So why not just, uh, you know, make the, the, the board broader so everybody can continue to play and play with each other and work with each other more importantly, right? So fill me in a little bit on the frustrations, right? Like what, what are the things you've been waiting for? What are the frustrations you're seeing people have mm -hmm. that, um, that are not being addressed by Adobe that you think you could better address with this, with this sure. board? Okay. So there's always been some kind of frustration uh, around Magento because, well, probably around any software project, but with Magento, it's always been this commercial entity developing the software. And then there was a whole ecosystem with their own needs and only some of those needs could be satisfied naturally, right? You can't make everybody happy. So there's some frustration. Um, it's just a matter of balance between frustration and getting what's needed. Um, now, for what we're talking about right now, this effort for me personally, it started back in 2000, uh, whatever it was, 14 or something. There was this Magenta to develop a better initiative. They got a whole bunch of people together in the States and then they also did one in, in Berlin and uh, each pe person who was invited got asked to prepare uh, something about a specific topic to present to the others and they wanted to get uh, feedback and everything. So all I remember from that back then is a lot, is a lot of good discussions and well, there were already were quite a number of critical voices about some choices that were made. For example, in regards to less, in regards to UI components, in regards to, well, uh, several things. Um, not everything, but just some things. And, well, my impression afterwards was Adobe back then, Magento, right? It wasn't Adobe yet, said they wanted to listen, but despite all the feedback, at least the feedback that I heard and that I gave, nothing happened. <laughs> right? It's kind of some cost fallacy. Everything just stayed, oh no, we'll just go, go with less because you can change it on your own if you need to. And we invested so much into that and there are some reasons, but they didn't want to change it. Same with the UI components, same with all the other stuff in there. So whatever choices were made never, never got corrected. And here we are today, 2021, and most of that still is pretty much like it was back then. So the parts of Magento 2 that uh, I like working with, right, the whole dependency injection, uh, plugin system, um, a lot of the XML configuration, uh, layout XML, uh, many of the things that actually also were inherited from Magento 1, they aren't bad, they're great, actually. They empower a lot of the customizability in Magento and empower people to do their job every day. But some other things just, well, not so much. And um, yeah, um, in a way, I feel taking things in our own hands will allow us to make a stronger statement how things could be. 
And maybe that will have a stronger influence on how things develop upstream, because then it's possible for them to notice, oh, wait a moment, whoever is in charge of making decisions, that actually seems to be working out quite well. So maybe we might adopt that too, you know? And I totally get Adobe maybe being hesitant to experiment since Magento open source is inherently part of Adobe commerce. So introducing any kind of risk or instability is probably a huge, uh, you know, risk <laughs> to, to the product. You can't. So having a more lightweight, faster moving uh, distribution that might try new things and see how they work out in, in the real world might be, you know, big, provide a lot of value. We're going to get into the plan for this here in, in just a little bit. And I, I see some questions in the chat that we will cool. definitely address. Keep those questions coming. Um, you had mentioned previously that, that there's just a lot of people in this ecosystem that are moving on to other things and, and different platforms and, and advancing their careers in different directions. But everything changes. Uh, software, oh, yeah. you know, software development, the technologies that are used, how platforms are built, uh, evolves extremely quickly. A and so, you know, how much of that change, though, is, is just inevitable? It's just, you know, people advancing their careers and, and moving into different opportunities. It's, you know, just a technological shift of how things are done that leaves certain platforms in, in the past. Um, and, you know, how much of that is, is more just that versus, uh, you know, it, are we trying to hang on to something that is not going to have viability long term anyway? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great question. And one that I've been asking myself a lot, too. Um, so I'm, I've been looking at different shopping systems over the last couple of years, different platforms thinking about uh, maybe investing into other platforms um, because it seemed like a smart choice. And after having worked with several, and I, you know, we even built lizards and pumpkins back then as like an alternative front end. And I learned a lot, right? I, I've also enjoyed learning other languages and uh, building things in them and e-commerce specific, non-e-commerce specific. So, one thing I've realized, though, uh, not too long ago, actually, only after uh, Willem created Hoover. Hoover, sorry, Hoover. <laughs> um, yeah, I realized, you know what, anything that I could build with Shopware or Shopify, I can build that with Magento. There's no real reason for me to switch except for, well, my friends now hang out there. However, I have invested a lot into Magento. I can actually build things a lot quicker with Magento than with any of the other platforms. So there's that, right? I, I can gain more from my investment into Magento so far. Uh, plus I've got a certain reputation with uh, Magento because I've just, I guess, I've hung around for long enough and I'm loud enough to, <laughs> at least in the Twitter bubble, right? So people kind of, uh, I am aware of what I'm doing a little bit. So anyway, Magenta has been great to me, all in all, as a platform, as an ecosystem, and I'm very grateful about it. So moving on, uh, to be honest, I don't really feel like learning another e-commerce framework or, or you know, I, I built stuff with Symfony-based applications, Oro um, and, and Shopware and, and others. And that's great, you know, don't get me wrong, they're all good platforms, but they're not inherently better in any way. At least that's my conclusion at the moment. So um, why not really try to make a difference here and, um, you know, give a breath of fresh air in, in the Magento ecosystem. So, and moving on, sure, there's always a certain flux of people who kind of just move on. That's always been the case and that's totally okay. Um, it's more this feeling that I was uh, sharing that, you know, the days of Magento are numbered. It's going to be two years and then it's kind of gone. And that's the driving force behind many people moving on. It's not really the current state now, because from most of the agencies that I'm in contact with, Magento still is 
great as a platform to build on. So it's a pretty good sell to customers, right? And it's nothing, nothing real. It's just a sense of doom. And that's completely in our minds. It doesn't have to be that way at all. Right? And learning new technologies, I certainly write code very differently now than I did a year ago or two years ago. So you know, I think it's certainly possible to progress and take all the learnings, also all the learnings I, I gathered from the other platforms and languages and also apply them while building things with Magento. Yeah. One of the problems as, you know, as a platform, as an ecosystem, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, all the cool kids were doing open source tinkering, right? Like everyone was very technical. It was very code heavy. These days, a lot of people that are just getting into the ecosystem, even if they're developers, um, if they're just playing around, they're doing it for fun. They've, you know, maybe they're trying to start their own business. A lot of those people are choosing SaaS platforms just because they're easier. A lot of people mm -hmm. that are tinkering are more marketing focused or trying to build a product, not necessarily development. And so as, as an open source platform and, and as a moderately complicated open source platform, uh, Magento is not the easiest thing to get into. It's not the easiest thing for someone right. to just pick up that is very inexperienced in development and, and to do it well. And so yes. if we have this feeling of we've developed and sharpened these skills in building Magento and we just don't want to lose that. Like it, it's, it's not, it's Magento is very fast for you to develop stuff, but you have just a ton of experience for someone else. That experience is probably quite different. And so if, if you continue down this path, because even, even Adobe is moving more toward a SaaS model, right? Like it's going to be cloud-based microservices, um, and, and if we keep this monolith, this PHP um, behemoth, and I, I know, you know, we'll talk about some of the initiatives you've had around, you know, theming and things that, that are trying to make that simpler. But if we continue down this path, does it just become a platform for people that have sharpened their skills in the past but, and don't want to move on versus building a vibrant ecosystem? Like you've got to have an influx of new, fresh talent. Mm -hmm for this to be successful, even, even Magento open source, if it just continues down the Adobe path, there has to be new talent coming in to keep this, uh, this fresh, because we're always going to be losing people. Yeah. People are going to be retiring. Um, and so, you know, that whole, we know how to use it. We like it doesn't make it a successful product. So how, how are you going to combat that? Yes, uh, I very much agree. So that's one of another one of the reasons why I think it's important to um, one of the areas Magento could be improved, make it more develop, um, accessible uh, to new developers. So many of the choices Magento did uh, for good reasons um, have, have led to this uh, lack of new people joining the ecosystem because yeah, it got more, more complex. And I'm pretty in touch with that, I believe, because I've been giving trainings for many, many years now like nine years at least. And so, so every time a new training was uh, scheduled, uh, many times I've seen people struggle for a week just to get a development environment set up. And that's ridiculous, right? And people saying, well, we have Warden or back in the day it was Vagrant or whatever. In many situations, that's not a solution, right? Just recently there was a big corporation. Well, recently, it was like nine months ago. They were doing a training and they couldn't use a warden or any other Docker-based environment that synchronized with the local file system because the corporation um, protocols dictated there had to be some antivirus. Every file that got synchronized needed to be scanned. So the whole thing just it wasn't possible to use it that way. So they ended up having to run it locally on a Windows stack. And that could be made so much easier. And that alone would already make it a lot easier for people to get started. Just download the zip, unpack it, PHP and MySQL, um, that should be all that's required and it should just work. And um, yeah, that, that should definitely be possible to get Magento into a state running. That way support Windows officially as a development instance without having to use WSL or, or anything because why not? It's, it's not rocket science to be honest. And um, that would certainly help people get back in. Another thing that's changed over the years is 
nowadays we have a lot of great training materials. So I dropped out of the content creation about a year ago, but there's many other people like Yissa, like Joseph Maxwell, like Mark Schust, right? They produce excellent content. So onboarding new developers is for, for Magento development is, is now is easier than ever before. And uh, there's still Mage 2 TV, of course. Uh, most of that material, uh, well, maybe not the, the setup scripts, right? But a lot of it is still very relevant after all. So, and um, yeah, so there's a lot of knowledge out there, which actually is, uh, hasn't been there the first two or three years with Magento 2. So those were the hard years. The kids coming up now actually have it easy, <laughs> right? So, and the second thing is regarding all the people choosing SaaS platform, I think there's a sweet spot for Magento. And that is not the very small ones who just want something off the shelf. Because the strongest strength, the strongest strength, I don't know, I'm missing uh, vocabulary here. The one of the strengths of Magento is its uh, customizability. So I see a need for Magento if you have somebody who has this amazing idea, right? They want to build something that requires some kind of customization and all the rest can be off the shelf, right? And you can do anything with Magento. That's, that's the great thing about it. And that's actually, it's still much more customizable than any other platform that I've noticed so far that I've started to work with, at least uh, given the amount of effort to put into it. So I think there's certainly reason if somebody wants to, for example, own the data, do some kind of customization, um, then a self-hosted um, e-commerce platform like Magento is, is awesome. And if you bring it back down into the range where a single developer or two developers can actually finish a, a project in, in a reasonable amount of time, then, uh, you know, it's a winner. It definitely is. <laughs> it's very strong. It's hard to argue with the fact that there is a place in the market for non sas options. Uh, the, the problem you're going yeah. to be up against, though, is that to continue to innovate and to be agile and nimble and to outpace the innovation from uh, you know, someone like Adobe that has a, a team of engineers and product managers that are, that are running through that, uh, you're going to have to have money. Like there, there is, I understand that a lot of the contributions to the Magento ecosystem are from the community, but I would argue that those are still financially motivated, um, contributions for the most part. Like those people are working around so. the platform. They, you know, they make their living from the platform in one way or another. Now, you know, they may be spending extra time or whatever contributing to it, but if, if they were to be working on some other platform, they're not going to continue those contributions. And so, you know, money is, is the thing that, that makes this um, platform or any platform work. The agencies are selling a platform because they can make a living selling it. If, if we can't charge someone to build a site on this platform, or if merchants are not choosing it when we're trying to propose it, then we, we won't be able to continue to support it long term. And so, you know, being completely open source, there, there haven't been a ton of extremely successful forks from a commercially viable product that continues to be commercially viable without building some business model around it. I mean, I think there are some notable examples, but it's not a, an extremely common thing. So how do you, how do you provide the financial support to a fork to try to still be innovative? Like you're, you're trying to outpace a big organization with a lot of engineers and a community that's contributing um, pretty rapidly to, to that platform. How do you try to compete with that without financial resources or how do you build those financial resources to do so? Well, first, I think you're absolutely right. All the contributions in the Magento ecosystem happens only because it provides the livelihoods for all these people and companies, which in turn also provide the livelihoods to all these people, right? And that's also one of the reasons why I think creating this alternative distribution is valuable because it keeps all these livelihoods uh, you know, viable. Now, I'm actually a pretty big, uh, I, I like a lot of what Adobe has been doing. 
all the stability improvements, all the tooling they've been developing around Magento, and that includes Magento open source, right? All this uh, decomposition, so really splitting up the dependencies in a way and really trying to put it with a big emphasis on backward compatibility. That's all great. I'm not opposed to it at all. In fact, by doing that, they're making my life and our life a lot easier. And I, I plan for my part to heavily build on that when building this alternative di distribution together with the others. It's, it's exactly what should be happening. And uh, so in a way, I don't really see us competing in that regard with, with a company like Adobe. To be honest, I think Adobe doesn't care about the community contributions from a financial standpoint, right? They could just as well hire developers to do the same work. It's more a, May, I don't know exactly what the reasoning there is. It's certainly maybe some image, maybe it's a, it's an experiment, but all the time developers put in there for free, basically, that's not a reason for them to have open source. It's probably more like market reach or something. So anyway, um, I think there's a certain agility in being small. The first time I noticed that was in when Magento 1.4 was released, uh, just after Enterprise Edition came out. And before that, I worked on a number of Magento projects, and all of them were late. Right? All of them were six months late, whatever. So it kind of seemed like, well, that's just how it is. However, this one customer of mine that I was working with, they had a small team of three developers who were basically, you know, it's, it's quite a big international company actually, right? And they were taking care of the CMS system back there and they decided, well, we want to do online and we'll just start it. And, and these three developers managed to get the whole project done on time and it blew my mind. So that was so awesome and a long time ago now, but that made me realize if we have a small team of people, it can move a lot quicker than a large team of people. If these people are attuned, right? So if it's a team that just where people come and go, that doesn't make it fast, that makes it slower. But if they know what they're doing, they know each other, they can pull a lot of weight. So there's a certain strength there, a certain agility. Another thing, of course, is scope. So if Adobe builds something, it has to work in, well, I guess 90% of all cases who, who use Magento. Right? There'll always be some cases that aren't covered and those will have to customize a certain aspect, but it has to cover this really broad range. Now, custom development can be great if the scope of what actually needs to be done for one specific use case is quite limited, right? Then building it might be a much better option than taking something off the shelf and customizing it. So um, that's, I think, this, this scenario where, where customizing Magento works very well. And I believe by, by having a, this alternative distribution, a small team of contributors will be able to contribute features that don't have to work for 90% of the market. You know, and they'll be optional features. So it's kind of like these services that, um, Adobe is creating, right? Their live search, right? Or Adobe Analytics. That's not for everybody using Magento. It's just for a certain segment, you know, product recommendations, whatever. So they're like additional service that can be used in addition to Magento. So if, if we and, and other contributors uh, manage to develop alternative features that are just for a segment of the Magento market, then they don't have to cover 90% of all use cases, you know, and, and we still keep that core that covers all the use cases. And then we have this one feature. And if that's for you, it, it, it totally rocks and it does exactly what you want. And it does it in a very performant and scalable way. And I think that's totally possible by utilizing this idea of, uh, you know, fewer people can move quicker. I, you know, hard to argue with that as far as fewer people can move quicker. I, mean, I have a, saying I, I use a lot in, in sales conversations with, with merchants and, you know, what one can, one, what one developer can do in a day, two developers can do in two days. Um, so, you know, just adding more people doesn't make things more efficient adds adds overhead oftentimes. But if you're going to have these people developing these features, 
um, then is this a model where you try to keep the core intact and you're developing these add-on modules and then you're trying to you're trying to monetize the the add-on or the development of the platform or are you just relying on people who are you know committed to magento open source are you relying on them to just kind of switch their contributions from core over to developing this alternative feature set that that could be a complement or an add-on or a replacement for Magento Open Source. Like I'm just trying to make sure I understand the financial yeah. model there. Very good, very good point. Okay, so yeah, I didn't actually answer any any question, any part of your question in regards to finances. So I believe uh, there has to be uh, money involved to make this whole thing work. Any contribution, like you said, in the end is financially motivated. Maybe because it's something that just doesn't work for clients so it needs to be fixed or it's a feature that's needed so it's got to be developed and then sharing it is just a matter of gaining reputation or getting sick and tired of maintaining patches yourself so um in regards to core development one of the problems that magento has had in the past not always but sometimes is that Magento for a long time wasn't like the people developing the core, they weren't doing, were not doing projects. So there's a certain disconnect. Right? Some things were developed or built in a certain way that didn't really match up to what was needed. I don't know if you experienced that or not, but for me, it, it felt, you know, felt like that sometimes, not all of it again, right? But sometimes. So um, I'm currently trying to figure out the best way forward here because, oh, sorry. Well, that's all right. Might be my phone there. Um, all right. So uh, I actually I, I had a little presentation that I, I showed some people at Meet Magento Poland um, about a possible way how this could look. Now I don't want to share this publicly yet because it's just one of several possibilities how how the whole thing could work, and I believe um, at the moment we are working with the Magento Association as part of the Magento Association, um, you know, trying to build this open uh, source task force, I guess it's called. So we'll, we'll see. But one possible way this, this could end up is if we have a, you know, and again, this is just one of multiple possible scenarios. Let's assume this new distribution finds its home as part of the Magento Association. Okay. Now, the Magento Association currently is financed by partners. We all know there's these emails, know and love them. Uh, then Adobe also, I guess, pays some money. I don't know the details because the finances aren't uh, public, but uh, that's okay. Now, from what I've heard, there's going to be paid memberships sooner or later. There's a membership committee working on that. And so there's some financing there. But of course, that's peanuts compared to what's available uh, to Adobe. So the idea that um, I find the most promising, but again, that's just one of several possibilities, is to follow a model that's similar to what the Typo 3 Association did. I don't know if you're familiar with it, are you? I'm not. Okay, so what they did, they founded this association 15 years ago or something, and it was a nonprofit and, you know, membership and everything and uh, at one point what they did was they founded a a company funded by completely by the association so the community association owns the company to 100 percent this company is a limited so a german gmbh in this case or but it could be a lcc or you know whatever uh, british ltd doesn't matter just some real business unit and this uh, company in terms of a uh, type of three provides additional services like a long-term support, um, SLAs, uh, certification, these kind of things. But the important thing it is it does not and may not compete with the ecosystem. So it doesn't do type of three projects. It doesn't do body leasing, right? So it doesn't compete with freelancers. It doesn't compete with agencies at all. It just, it only exists to support the ecosystem. Now, if such a company existed, and again, the, the genius twist there is, it's owned by the community, and the community isn't owned by the company, it's just turned on its head, 
right? And don't get me wrong, that company has a lot of employees and they get paid and everything, but that company doesn't do core development. Instead, what I imagine might be a way forward is if companies like agencies or merchants were able to hire a developer or developers to work on certain features they would require, right? So if these agencies or these uh, merchants or maybe even freelancers, right? If they were able to apply for funding by that company, that would guarantee that any development that happens is relevant because it's actually required by the people working with the product, doing, doing the work, you know, using the platform as a merchant. And uh, that way it would be possible to, to fund the development in a very relevant way um, without having to rely on sponsorships. Yeah? And that's a model that actually works. It's proven to work for years now. So that's one possibility. Okay. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of folks in the ecosystem, especially around hosting. Mage Mojo, in particular, they they really only do Magento hosting, and they'll you know they'll get left behind by the move to you know, cloud microservices, and so it's definitely in their best interest to continue to support the platform in whatever direction it goes, as long as it stays some sort of open source platform that that they can support. So I, I would agree that there's you know you you've got some potential models there. There's a lot of partners in the space that. Um, you know, I have, have financial incentive to, to keep it alive. Um, and then this whole, you know, foundation model, I guess, I guess makes a, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, obviously there's some, some holes to fill and some gaps to figure out there. Um, but yeah. I, you know, my, my question then becomes, and I'm, we've got a lot of questions in the chat. I'm going to get to those after this one. Um, I just want to make sure we touch on the, the Magento Association. Because I think a lot of people's understanding was that this is what the Magento Association, even though they didn't necessarily claim this off um, from from its launch, but a lot of people just figured that was kind of the caretaker of Magento open source eventually when Adobe decided that you know they were going to significantly deviate from from what Magento open source can do once they finally kind of get critical mass of of microservices to just kind of sunset uh, Magento open source to the association. Now that that may be, you know, uh, something they were actually considering. It may not be. I just know that was the sentiment in the community at the time. Uh, so, like, is the Magento Association the right way of going about this, that keeping that official tie to Adobe and trying to, you know, work with them for the long-term health of the platform or – is it is it better to kind of start over fresh and sever those um, ties? Again, I don't really see this in any way as a competition to Adobe. I think both like Magento and the whole ecosystem actually profits greatly from Adobe by by supporting Magento uh, open source and Adobe Commerce. Uh, alone, the name is you know great to have that back there. And then, of course, for the partners, there might be additional benefits um, for the Adobe partners, right? So I, I don't really see this at all going against what they're doing or anything. So one of the problems I see with the Magenta Association taking over Magenta Open Source is that Magenta Open Source is inherently part of Adobe Commerce. So Adobe can't risk putting that, giving that out of their hands because what if somebody decides to make a big, big, you know, if they don't control what happens and there's a big incompatible change, and they can't stop it. Whoa, you know, <laughs> what about Adobe Commerce? Impossible, right? Uh, so in Adobe's shoes, the person who is running Adobe Commerce, hell no, I wouldn't give that out of my hands. I need to control what happens there because it's Adobe, Magento Open Source is the core of Adobe Commerce. You know, Adobe Commerce is a layer on top of Magento Open Source. Same with B2B, etc. So. Um, yeah, there's no way that can actually be handed over as long as it's part of Magento open source. I, I think, and that's just me guessing, I might be completely wrong, but I think that's probably the reason why nothing has happened there. I wasn't involved in anything. I have heard originally that the Magento Association might take over Magento open source at one point in time. I don't know, maybe, but again, I wasn't part of that at all. 
I, I kind of didn't really think it through back then. I just heard about it and thought, oh yeah, that would be cool. I, I never actually got involved in the Magenta Association. All I know is now, a couple of years later, from my perspective, not a lot has happened. You know, before there were events, now there are events. Before it was a Magento, uh, Meet Magento Association or whatever, now it's Magento Association. Uh, for myself, it doesn't really make a difference. So I'm sure people are doing work, but I don't notice it, <laughs> right? <laughs> because I'm not involved and I have no idea what's going on with, uh, with the open source effort there. So it's all kind of hush hush and quiet. And I guess people are talking to other people and don't want to interrupt that process. But I think by decoupling that from Magenta open source, maybe it's possible to move things um, more visible, more visibly and uh, quicker and more independent of Adobe. And again, I don't see this as anti-Adobe or anti-Adobe commerce or anti-Magento association. I just think it's in all our best interest to, to, um, to do this. And from my perspective, it only makes the whole ecosystem stronger and that includes Adobe. All right, let's get uh, to the questions okay. in the chat and the comments. Uh, we've, we've got at least 12 minutes left here. So if you want us to go deeper into any of this, then post it. I'll always leave it to the chat um, to ask the the tough questions. The first one, Willem says he's been trying for thirty minutes, could not get into the uh, conversation here. So sorry, Willem. I'm not sure what the technical issues is. First time we've ever had an issue like that. I'll have to start doing just sound checks the day before the live stream to try to figure those things out. But I apologize. We yeah. definitely missed you here in the conversation. Very much so. Willem has a very nice way to put things that I appreciate a lot. So he really takes the time to try to, we have this German expression of you know, hit the nail on the head. <laughs> he really sinks the nail. So I, I love it when he does that. So anyway, would it be nice to have him here. Gary says you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. Well, you know, Vinay said he was going to go grab a drink. I was like, I might as well. I haven't really, I've only had one little sip here since we've started this live stream. So I, I haven't gone too far, although this Ooh, is not morning here. single barrel barrel strength. So this is a hundred and what is it? 29 proof. So fairly significant. Uh, Antonio in the chat says, is there a roadmap in this process of the fork with a defined plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tricky. At the moment, we are a small group of people. And we consciously made the choice to keep it as a small group because we wanted to move quickly. We uh, we are, have a very uh, good understanding that we don't represent everybody in the community at all. Right? It's just us. But that's a temporary thing. So we are working towards that not being the case anymore and opening it up. So yes, we are actually in the process of building something currently focused on the technology only because building an organization at this time doesn't make sense because we're working with the Magento Association. If that doesn't pan out for some reason, and I don't hope so, actually, I, I've got great hope there to that things do work out with the association. So if, but if that doesn't pan out, then of course, we'll also build an organization around it. But um, yeah, as soon as we have this things in place there, then, you know, We'll, we'll be starting to, to get more people on board. So right now we also set up a Discord server that will be opening up pretty soon for people who want to ask questions directly there. So uh, yeah, we've got stuff in the pipeline. The first thing that we have to figure out is uh, how exactly are we going to build the distribution? So, okay, we'll have a mirror, we'll have a fork from the mirror, then we'll have a, you know, a way to build uh, packages out of that and, uh, and uh, um, like a packages repository people can use to install from and uh, how about naming how about versioning so all these things are currently being defined uh, yeah so the next comment really more so than a question and I, I think this goes back to uh you know that you had mentioned specifically that a lot of the movement from magento open source was just people try to anticipate what's coming and not necessarily the current state of things, right? Like they're just, they're expecting something bad to happen. So they, they're, you know, looking for alternatives. Uh, and in the chat here, my biggest fear is not about something new, 
but the monetary changes that it may cause may cause in my life. And, and so, I, you know, it's one of those things where people are always having to look into the future, right? Like we, we want to continue to survive and thrive. And, and so you make that, you want to make those decisions as soon as possible to ease that transition. So I, I would yep. just like to get your, you know, your thoughts on that comment right there as, as, you know, just kind of an understanding of um, how people are thinking about the ecosystem currently. Oh, I, I feel it. I mean, I, tr I try to think ahead and figure out what's going to happen. I guess I've got a 50, 50 chance, just like anybody else. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's natural of course, to, to try to, to look ahead and be smart about things. If our livelihoods depend on it, it matters, right? Probably it's not just us, it's our families. And there are so many commitments we have to, we have to fulfill. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's one thing looking ahead, trying to figure out what's going to happen. And right now though, and I didn't go into that, right? So this realization that I had was, that's not the only chance I have. So I, I'm not limited to just trying to figure out what's going to happen. I can actually make stuff happen in a certain way or help make, you know, I don't have to do it alone, thankfully. And that feels great. It's, it's feels, uh, it's relieving to figure out, you know, I'm not limited to what other forces do. I can, change things, how things happen. And that's great. Another example in the chat here of really Adobe and Magento's move more toward a SaaS model is, is really around a SaaS pricing model for the extensions. So we have subscription based extensions don't look good for small business. So things that you used to be able to pay a hundred dollars for, and that's it, you've got it forever. Now you might have to pay 10, 20, yeah. $100 a month. Well, to be honest, I'm a bit surprised that didn't happen earlier. For extension vendors, it's extremely hard to, to cover support for extensions while having a one-time fee only, right? Uh, it's, it's a really hard business model um, because of the support issue. And it really needs to a lot of investment has to be made into the su proper support channels and help desks to get that running and make that profitable. And kudos to everybody who actually made that work because I know many people who started an extension business and stopped because of that reason. Having an, a subscription model, I think, makes that a lot easier. So as a merchant, um, well, of course, it depends on the amount for a subscription, but in a way it, um, it actually isn't a bad thing because it makes ongoing support and development of what of the tools that I use much more feasible. So you know, I don't know if it's bad. And hopefully, there always will be open source extensions we can use and build on too. And uh, maybe extension vendors will continue to offer one time um, pricing models, maybe over their own stores, not just the marketplace, and so on, which says, uh, which said, I guess, um, most extension vendors prefer to sell through their own sites anyway, because well, 30%, uh, that's 30%, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think this is definitely a good thing long-term. Anything that costs more money for a merchant sucks because you're used to paying this and now it might cost you more. Um, that that's bad. I, I understand the, the aversion to that, but on the flip side, as you mentioned, building an, building a module company is very, very difficult. Like the finances of that are, are really, really complicated. Um, when you're selling something for a hundred dollars and that's, that's it. And now you've got to support it for a, a long period of time. That's why you've seen a lot of companies like web shop apps build out SAS, you know, shipper HQ systems instead mm -hmm. of selling modules, but not everyone could do that. So now you can really embrace the open source nature of your modules, keep them open source, without building some big SaaS platform that, that removes that open source capability, but still generate enough revenue to make the business work. Right, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, right? And as a merchant, well, if you have to pay a hundred bucks a month, that might be significant, right? I'm actually very interested in this small merchant segment. So in that case, probably it 
you know, it might be worth having an open source alternative that doesn't come with support, for example. Maybe it's worth just running a subscription model just for the support alone. I don't know. Depends. Definitely. Uh, all right. Just going through the comments here to try to pick out any questions we may have. Um, like Cal Evans mentioning here, any company contributing back to open source, even if they're selling their innovations to others are still contributing back to open source. Well said. And then Antonio here says contribution of the community are critical for stability. And I, I believe that to be the case for a fork as well. Um, you're going to have yes. to have, um, you know, you're going to have to have that, that community of contributions if you're going to maintain any sort of, yeah. uh, you know, consistent growth. Absolutely. No, I agree very much with that. In fact, I hope, I don't know, but I hope that having an alternative distribution with a more, uh, with a slightly different um, process or b being a little less risk averse in regards to a new to new things, I put it that way, um, might be super valuable for people contributing because I know several people, me myself included, who kind of stopped contributing to the Magento core because it might take a year or two to get something merged and that's just not fun, right? Definitely not fun. Um, just yeah. all right. So I'm I'm gonna cap it. We're we're you know if you've got your questions in, uh, we will try to get those answered. We've got just a couple of more. Uh, a lot of people not really loving the SaaS model in the chat. Understand that. Um, all right. So Aaron here says, does Adobe's recent statement about helping merchants introducing new features as microservices, effectively stating future releases will no longer contain functional improvements in the monolith? Um, so is, is, you know, if they're, if they're trying to introduce new features as microservices, then I mean, obviously they're going to build out the code in the monolith that supports that microservice, right? Like they have Adobe Sensei product recommendations, but that's, that's still a, some code that is in, in the monolith. It's just, you know, connecting to these, these external, um, services, but like, is that, is that your understanding is that this move to microservices ends the monolith or is it really just an addition to no i i um so i very much agree with that statement i don't think there'll be any functional uh, new features in the monolith and that's okay because now we can build them ourselves and that's where all this decomposition comes into play and is actually valuable for for us as a as a community in open source if we have this alternative distribution that allows us to capitalize on that without being reliant on only the Adobe services. In fact, my hope is maybe Adobe will start offering these services for open source merchants too. At the moment, they're included only in Adobe Commerce, but I don't know if they can come up with a business model that's actually interesting for them to include them in open source, but technically that shouldn't be a problem. And in the same way, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to develop new features in the same way, because then, so as a merchant, of course, total cost of ownership is greatly affected if updates are harder. Right? So every time we make a lot of changes, a big expensive update is coming down the road and nobody loves that, right? Except the people doing the initial code changes. So I really, I'm, I'm not a fan of these kind of updates. And that's something Adobe has done a pretty good job with, to be honest. So updates to Magento Core have been a lot, they've become easier and easier and easier and better and better. And that's great. I hope they continue doing, you know, working that way. So uh, I think the recent move to reducing the number of releases and scheduling them ahead for, you know, a long time goes into the same direction. So that's basically lowering the total cost of ownership for merchants, making it easier to update. And having these additional features as external services that can be released independently makes a lot of sense because then they can be updated without requiring an, an, a core update. However, the same approach can be used for in-process customization and services. Right? It doesn't have to be a SaaS microservice running somewhere in the cloud that only can be customized through uh, you know, Firefly or, or whatever you want. So there are many different ways this can be utilized. And um, if you will then want to use something like an external microservice, 
offered by Adobe or something that you run on your own server as a separate process or something that you run in the process, um, but as an additional module that still can be implemented well, you know, in a more decoupled way um, that can be independently updated, that uh, that's basically just a matter of uh, several factors that you want to take into account, like data privacy or um, just hosting costs or, you know, dependency on third parties or uh, whatever, many different things, in-house capabilities, etc. So, yeah, I don't think there'll be any functional improvements to open source. We are responsible for those. All right, continuing in the chat, Simona doesn't, she, she doesn't trust Adobe. And Adobe, in their announcement, always try to look for the most nefarious meaning. Uh, several several chats here from Simona, not, not a big fan of Adobe. Uh, you know, it's, and it's a common theme, especially when something starts off as open source and, you know, it's really, really heavily community driven. When, you know, big businesses come in, they have to do big business things. Like that's, that's just the nature of it, right? Like they have to, they can't be completely transparent with what they're doing. They have to try to extract value from the things they're adding to the platform. It, it, it just changes the vibe a little bit. And you see an, an awful lot of the community um, not enjoy that transition. Yeah. So all I can say is the people I know in Adobe, I kind of trust them and maybe I'm naive. You know, I, I tend to be, um, I tend to believe people are inherently good. Maybe that's stupid, but I choose to believe it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it's going deeper than I intended. So um, yeah, I think the people in Adobe, they're doing their job and really trying to do it right. The only reason why choices are being made is because it makes sense for what they hear from their customers and trying to make money at the same time for Adobe. And there's nothing bad there. It's just that it's a very limited subset of customers that have very different requirements than by volume, the largest part of the market based on my experience again, that's also just a limited view on the market, I guess. Um, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to make money. I mean, that's why we're doing e-commerce. So, okay, we just have to change the game in a way that uh, we can win also. And that's what we're doing. Well said, well said. Um, we've got one comment here from Mark, uh, just mentioning subs will default to one year, have access to code forever once purchased. Just an FYI of what he heard from a little birdie. So just a little bit of interesting information there on um, how how the subs are going to work for for modules. Um, so I'll I'll yes, give it to you. Any, awesome. any party? Go ahead. No, no. Uh, I just want to say, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't I didn't know that. Um, probably there'll be some changes because I guess it's a new subscription model service, and they've got to figure stuff out. Same for the extension vendors, but that's interesting. Yeah, thanks. So I, that's all of the uh, that's all of the questions I had as of the cutoff. I appreciate you. We're running a little bit late. I appreciate you giving me an extra five minutes here. So I'm gonna let you have the parting shots here. Um, all right. Sell me on the fork. If if somebody just joined, what what are we doing? Give me give me the rundown on uh, why we should be doing this fork. Leave people with uh, what you will on on you know what you're trying to accomplish. Well, we're doing this fork to ensure the long-term viability of the Magento platform for not just the top 1% clients, but for everybody. And that's exciting and that's pretty cool. So that's it. All right. All right. I appreciate everybody joining this, uh, this morning or this evening, if you're overseas and uh, as always, a, a fantastic live stream. Um, you know, we we enjoy having these more technical live streams. You know, sometimes they they get a little superficial. So it's always great to have someone with your expertise on here, Vinay, sharing um, what you know could be a, a very important initiative for the future of Magento Open Source. Yeah, I hope so. I'm pretty happy that a lot of the initial drama has kind of subsided. I I guess that's how it goes. So now the actual working phase begins because 
in the end, actions speak louder than words. And that's exactly where a lot of the distrust towards Adobe and open source comes from. But again, I think that's uh, some, some limits in regards to communication. Maybe that could have been done a bit better. And um, yeah, in the end, I re really want to invite everybody just to judge what we're going to be doing. And then if you like it, participate. You know, play Absolutely. along. <laughs> contribute um all right so if you would Vinay, if you've got a few extra minutes i'm going to end this live yeah. stream and then i'll come back on here and you and i can catch up for just a minute um so again i appreciate everyone watching and uh we'll uh we'll catch up with you all later